Welcome back to Chinese 270, China and the West, week one. So you've already seen this map now a few times, right? This beautiful map. And if we were not in an online class, but in a classroom, I would use this map as a teaser and I would, I would throw some questions at you, but um, I'm gonna throw those questions at you anyway, and you can think about them. Um, as we make our way through week one, week two, week three. Is this a good opening slide for a course on Sino-Western relations? Is there anything cross-cultural about it? And in what way does it look different from other maps of the world you have seen? I, I hope you've noticed that this is a map of the world. Uh, and as I said, we will spend a lot more time with this map uh, in a few weeks. So stay tuned, but here are some, some teaser questions for you. Okay, um, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, there is a reading uh, this, this week that I, you know, I want you to do. It's the historical overview by Mongello from, from a book that really looks at Sino-Western relations. Uh, and we'll be reading some other chapters from that book. And the assignment uh, again, I want to throw this at you now. I'm going to repeat it at the end of class. Um, is really, you know, a short essay. Based on your reading of this week's text, then, I want you to write a short, roughly 300-word response in which you address at least three of these six questions. And the questions are, for the purpose of this class, what do we mean by China? What do we mean by the West? Why and when did Westerners travel to China? Why and when did Chinese people travel to the West? What were and are the motivations for cross-cultural encounters between China and the West? What are its perils? What are its benefits? To what degree can past encounter encounters help us make sense of Sino-Western relations today? Is there any information in the text about China or the West that surprised you? And as with pretty much any text that we're going to read over the next few weeks, I want you to make direct reference to the text by including page numbers, um, you know, when, when you cite a passage. So get into the habit of, of that, of those citations. Um, there is actually a lot to unpack just in the title of our class. And China and the West are two of those terms that look, you know, pretty obvious on the surface, but once we sort of get into, you know, the meaning of those terms, it gets actually a little bit more complicated. And we will be talking about this a lot, actually. And again, here are some questions that you might want to bear in mind. Who or what defines the boundaries of what constitutes China and the West? Have they always been the same? Can they mean different things to different groups of peoples? And here is a map 21st or 20th century map, Huntington's map of major civilizations. A scholar came up with this in sort of dividing of what we might call different major cultural group civilizations. And the West, right, is, is um, colored in blue. And it sort of uh, <laughs> spans the West, the center and the East, right? And, and then we have uh, in red, uh, the Chinese or Sinitic or Cynic. Note that it excludes certain territories that we might sort of think of as part of China when we look at the map today, and it includes certain territories like Korea and Vietnam that usually today we do not include, right, when we think of China. Let's start by talking about China a little bit. And China, of course, if we think of it as a country, a na modern nation state, we can put it on a map, right? And here we have the boundaries of that nation state China as we know it today. And as you make your way through the article by Mongello, um, you will see that we can talk about China, this entity, in different ways. We can talk about it as a cultural entity defined by a shared written language, a shared set of societal ethical values, and maybe shared religious beliefs. We can talk about it as a geographical or political entity defined by its borders. And those borders, of course, have shifted greatly over time. So what we see here 
in brown is the Qin Empire, which is sort of the first time much of the territory that does occupy modern China was united really as one country or one empire, and that is 220, started in 221 BC. Another way to think of it is a multiracial empire uh, that was able to unite in its borders lots of different ethnic groups and you know these ethnic groups were united by their adherence to certain sets of societal values um, maybe the written language in the case of China right so it kind of goes back to that first definition of cultural entities now since the 20th century we usually think of China as a modern nation-state that defines itself via constructed notions of nationalism and statehood and again, these are things we'll talk a lot more about, but what I wanted to make you aware of is, is that this term China is somewhat more complicated and less stable as it appears and something that changes and that has changed over time. Now, once you get into the article by Mungello, you will see that he spends a lot of time talking about the Ming Dynasty, a very important Chinese dynasty, ruled China from 1368 to 1644. Now, this is not the starting point of our class. We will go even further back to the Song Dynasty, to the Yuan Dynasty, when the Mongols ruled China. But we will actually spend a lot of time with the Ming Dynasty. And the reason why Mungelu spends so much time with the Ming Dynasty is because the Ming is really a shining dynasty, one of the most glorious dynasties, even though, as you can see from this map, it didn't actually occupy that much territory. It was only about half the size of today's China, only half the size of Qing Dynasty China, the last imperial dynasty in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Yet the Ming, in many ways, was really a golden age. I'm sure a lot of you know what this is, right? You've probably seen this before. This is, of course, the forbidden city in Beijing, palaces of the imperial family. And this was, for example, built during the Ming dynasty. And I'm quoting Mungello here. He says, by standard criteria such as size, population, agriculture, commerce, wealth, sophistication, technology, military might, cuisine, learning, literature, and the fine arts, the Ming dynasty presided over the greatest nation in the world. Wow. Right. So not England, certainly not America. Right. According to him in the 16th, 17th century, it was China that was the greatest nation in the world. Now, was the Ming very outward facing? Was it very interested in the outside world? Was it even interested in the West? As we will discuss in this class and as Mungello addresses in his chapter, it was for a while at least. There was during the early Ming a period of tremendous maritime exploration. However, that period then came to an end, in part because the coastal areas of China were exposed to pirate attacks by Japanese pirates, and as a result, the Ming essentially eliminated China's maritime trade, a vacuum that was eventually filled by European nations, and that led really to a much increased Sino-Western encounter that, again, we will be spending a lot of time discussing. So at that moment, you know, during the 15th century and the Ming Dynasty was still at its height, we see these big changes happening. Here you have uh, a model of a Chinese treasure ship from that period. And in the foreground, you have Portuguese ship, probably the kind of ship that carried Columbus to America. Uh, and you see that just in terms of sophistication, the Chinese ship obviously is far greater and, and, and bigger and imposing than the European ship. Yet at the same time, it was at that moment that European powers ventured further and further. And we see a new impetus also in Sino-Western relations. Now let's look at the West for a second. So the West for a long time consisted of Europe. Here we have a map of Europe, medieval Europe, the medieval West, the 13th century. So what was Europe in the 13th century? It was a conglomerate of lots of 
kingdoms, uh, empires. The biggest of them was the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't really an empire like the Chinese Empire. In that the Holy Roman Empire itself consisted really of lots of small kingdoms that were loosely united by a sort of coalition. If you look closely at the map, you see that there is a lot of monasteries on here. Monasteries uh, with libraries, and then not quite as many, but some universities. Things were also happening or start starting to happen in Europe. Europe was really moving out of the Dark Ages into the Renaissance. We have to wait maybe a little longer, but the Renaissance is on the way. And this is something we will actually address uh, in more detail in a couple of weeks. But religion still played a very important role in Europe. And here is another slide. And that uh, really allows us to think uh, of Europe uh, at that time also as a religious entity. Because even though Europe was really divided into all these different kingdoms, what might arguably have held it together was that shared religion, Christianity. And Christianity arguably was also one of the reasons why uh, European kingdoms entered into a huge cultural conflict with another religion, with Islam, and that led to the Crusades. And that in itself also, as you will see, has actually an impact on Sino-Western relations. But um, again, what I want us to remember here is that the interplay of religion, commercial, that is, you know, trade, and also territorial interests have a huge impact on Sino-Western encounters. So I mentioned commercial interests. And this is something that will come up again and again. Uh, there was one big impetus for trade, for trade that Europeans conducted with non-European peoples was for products that there was a high demand for uh, in Europe. Not all of these came from China. Some of them came from other places in Asia, in South Asia, peppercorn, nutmeg, cloves, cardamom. But later, of course, there were certain products that did come from China. Porcelain, tea, silk and fabrics. And this is something that, again, uh, we will talk about uh, again and again. It's something that Mungello in his article uh, talks about and something that would have a huge impact on Sino-Western relations. Now the question then of what motivated these cross-cultural encounters, be it religious, be it commercial, be it territorial, is something that we will ask ourselves uh, for every module. And our first module next week, of course, will be on Marco Polo. I'm sure you've all heard of Marco Polo that famous Italian who traveled to China in the 13th century. And of course, a question that we want to explore then is what motivated Marco Polo to travel to China? And following on from that, what lasting effects did the accounts of his journey have on Sino-Western relations? And of course, the same goes for the other way. What motivated Chinese, early Chinese travelers to venture westward. I already mentioned those uh, huge Chinese treasure ships, right? They were commandeered by a naval commander called Zheng He. Here you have him on a stamp. Uh, those of you who have taken classes with me before know that I like to use stamps because stamps can tell us so much about what is considered important to a country, uh, a society at a certain point in history, right? And what were the lasting effects of his journey on Sino-Western relations. And then, of course, I've already mentioned this, um, you know, we're going to be spending a lot of time on the Jesuit mission in China and its impact on Sino-Western relations, really both ways. Uh, we have two examples here, Matteo Ricci and Xu Guangqi. Um, both of these uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking in future weeks. Now, another term that Mungello brings up in his text, and that's really important to our class, is the idea of Sinocentrism versus Eurocentrism. So the map on top, right, you've now seen already many, many, many times, is actually a map of the world that was made during the Ming Dynasty. Uh, it involved some European, some Jesuit artists and some Chinese uh, artists and scientists, really. And what is, of course, interesting about this map is that China is really 
at the center, sort of at the center, right? More or less at the center. Um, so this is a map that we could call Sinocentric, right? With China uh, at the center. Uh, I told you that I was born in Germany. I grew up in Germany when, you know, when I was a kid. Most of the maps of the world that I looked at looked like this, <laughs> with Europe at the center. So this is a map that we call Euro. Centric. Now, the way that we look at the world uh, by way of a map, of course, has a huge impact on the way we think about the world and we think about our own place in that world, right? So, as you make your way through the Mongolo, uh, Mongello text for this week, I want you to think about what does he say about the Chinese view of the world in, say, around 1500 during the Ming Dynasty? Um, does he also say anything about the European view in 1500? And what does he say about the geopolitical reality in 1500? Um, and of course, you know, following on in 1800, 1900, uh, or even today. And how might that shape the way we think of the world, how we would, you know, picture the world on a map, where we would place the West, uh, be it Europe, be it America or China, right? So this idea of Sinocentricism versus Eurocentricism is something that is really at the core, I think, of our class and something that is really interesting because, again, we have these shifting paradigms. So I promised you I would remind you of the questions I want you to think about, right, for that first uh, reading response. Right? For the purpose of this class, what do we mean by China? What do we mean by the West? So I've thrown a couple of ideas at you, uh, and you will see that the text, Mungelo, he also throws a few more ideas at you. Why and when did Westerners travel to China? Why and when did Chinese people travel to the West? What are and were their motivations for cross-cultural encounters? What are its perils? What are its benefits? To what degree can past encounters help us make sense of China-Western relations to Today. And is there any information in the text about China or the West that surprised you? I look forward to reading your first response. I mentioned to you that we will have a discussion session every Thursday. We will not have it during the first week. We will not have it this Thursday, but we will start next week and after that every Thursday. Something else I forgot to say is for the quizzes, you will always have two attempts. Okay, so you can try it out. If you get something wrong, don't despair. You always will have a second attempt. All assignments are always due on Sunday at 9 p.m. However, if you need some extra time, just shoot me an email and ask for an extension. And to recap, so our homework, read the syllabus, browse the Adam site. Uh, you have to do a Flipgrid self-intro and an Adam glossary self-intro. Read the text, The Great Encounter, Historical Overview by Mongello. Complete the quizzes, post a Vocum item to the Vocum forum, and complete the forum post. And again, all assignments due Sunday, 9 p.m., extension granted upon request. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm just one email away.